uh, our last speaker is Tyler Jacks, and I think that you understand that we have a, a lineup here from MIT that's kind of extraordinary. It usually doesn't happen that you have, uh, you know, several giants in the same room. But uh, Tyler just received the Killian Award. He is a fantastic scientist, and as um, I think most of you know, he heads up the Koch Institute for Cancer here at MIT. I'm extremely excited to have him here, and um, he's going to take a crack at the secrets of cancer. Thank you. Great. Uh, Thanks. Actually, you have a mic. Oh, terrific. Thanks. Um, Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Sorry you're missing your break. Um, so I'm going to appear twice on your program. First, this presentation, which is going to be science heavy, talking about things that are happening in the lab. And then I'll participate in the panel discussion where we'll talk about more general things. And that will allow me to sort of wear my Koch Institute hat, where we think a lot about moving things from the lab out into industry and partnerships and so on. But let's start with the science. So in my lab, um, we're interested in many aspects of cancer development, and the tools that we use are demonstrated on this slide. Genetically engineered mouse models using sophisticated genetic engineering methods to introduce mutations into the germline or the soma of the animal in order to predispose the animal to cancer development and then study it in ways that are difficult to do in people or uh, impractical to do in people. And it, we've created a number of different models over the years in my lab, uh, lung cancer being a major focus, but also pancreas cancer, and as you can see on this list, many others as well. These tools are useful to allow us to better assess cancer gene uh, mutations and their contributions to tumor development. In addition, these models are useful in establishing new treatment paradigms, testing existing treatment paradigms, combination therapies. And we're also interested in shifting earlier and earlier, um, using these models to look at early detection of cancer and also maybe, before long, cancer prevention strategies. So that's the basic tool set that we use in my lab. Um, this is an example of a model that we use. We don't have time to go through it in great detail, but we basically program the germline of animals with mutations that are relevant to one or another cancer type, and then typically activate or inactivate those genes in the tissue of interest. Here, using the Cree locks for recombinase technology, we introduce a virus that carries Cree. This leads to the activation of RAS, inactivation of P53 in individual cells within the lung, and this gives rise to tumor development in a reproducible fashion, and these tumors progress all the way to malignancy and metastasis. And we can study the aspects of tumor development, again, using these models in ways that are otherwise difficult in people. The use of viruses to introduce CRE, this step here, um, gives us great flexibility to program into the tumor many other things that allow us to modulate the genomes of the tumor cells in, with great precision. You can put your favorite gene into the tumor cells and watch the consequences of the expression of that gene on tumor development. I'll give you an example of an immune modulating gene, but you can also introduce microRNAs or shRNAs to explore the functions of particular genes this way. Um, we're also using this method to inactivate genes of interest within developing cancer cells using the CRISPR-Cas9 system, and I'll give you examples of that in a moment as well. So lots of flexibility um, with this particular model in the lung, and that's extending also to other cancer types in my lab and in, in labs around the world. So with respect to the immune system, you've heard a lot of talk about this already. The immune system is incredibly powerful in controlling tumor development. We appreciate that more and more now, and ways to manipulate the immune system are becoming an attractive way to treat cancer. And I think well, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think there's much more to be done in stimulating immune responses against cancer. One of the challenges is understanding the complex interactions between the cancer cell uh, and the immune system in a living animal. You can't do that in people very well. You're basically looking at a snapshot when you look at a biopsy specimen. It's very difficult to look at the dynamic interactions between the cancer cells and normal cells, but these model systems in an immunocompetent setting, which these are, allow us to do that. And so we've used this method I've mentioned of introducing new genes into the cancer cells as they develop um, to address this question. It turns out you have to program the tumors with specific T cell antigens in order to observe an immune response. These tumors do develop with relatively few additional mutations. They have relatively low mutational load. They have mu not much for the immune system to see unless you program in additional mutations or, or proteins that the immune system can see. And this strategy allows us to do that. So we develop immunogenic tumors in this fashion. And when we do, we observe a response to those tumors. In brown, you can see here immune cells infiltrating into these tumors as they're developing. So the immune system sees these tumors by virtue of the programmed antigens that we're expressing in. That's the good news. And in addition, the immune cells make a difference. 
you're looking at, in white, non-immunogenic tumors growing over time. And in black, these immune uh, antigen-expressing tumors, which are being suppressed by the immune system. And this is an immune-specific response. If you get rid of the immune system in a rag mutant mouse, for example, you see no such inhibition. This is an immune-dependent phenomenon. So that's the good news. The immune system has an effect, just as we hoped that it might. The problem is it doesn't last. You can see after six months here, the, the antigen-expressing tumors catch up and kill the mouse more or less at the same time. And the reason for that is that the immune system gets suppressed. And that's exactly what happens typically in humans. You get an immune response, and the immune response is suppressed over time. And the goal of much of immunotherapy today is to bring that immune response back. Checkpoint inhibitors are designed to do that. Um, CAR T cells and various other methods that you've heard about are designed to do that. But we don't really understand the fundamental nature of that immunosuppression, and these systems allow us to do that. So we've been exploring this question in great detail now using this and related models in the lab. Now, there are a large number of potential uh, regulators of this immune response, the checkpoints I've mentioned, CTLA-4, PD-1, many others being developed, but also cellular components of the immune microenvironment which control the immune response. These two prevent the immune system from adequately seeing or attacking the tumor. And again, many unknowns here, many opportunities to understand the underlying science and hopefully translate that into new therapeutic approaches. We've looked at some of the checkpoints for those of you who are interested. PD-1 does get upregulated in these exhausted T cells in this model, but when we inhibit PD-1 with anti-PD-1 antibodies, we see no benefit. We see no tumor regression. That doesn't mean PD-1 is not involved, but it's not sufficient. And this, again, is an opportunity. What else might you need to do along with PD-1 combinations, CTLA-4, others? And those experiments are underway. <clears throat> but we've also looked at cellular components, including, uh, for example, the regulatory T cells, which, as many of you will know, are an, an important cell type that controls immune responses in the periphery. These cells are important in preventing autoimmune responses. If people or mice don't have regulatory T cells, they have massive autoimmunity. In addition, we believe that regulatory T cells play a role in controlling immune responses against cancer. Patients who have large numbers of regulatory T cells in their micro tumor microenvironment do less well because presumably those T regulatory cells are controlling a proper immune response. So we wondered whether that was true in this model system. Are T regs relevant to controlling the immune response in this system? And so Nick Joshi in the lab looked and first determined that indeed in this model, at the late stages where the immune system is being suppressed, we see higher numbers of Tregs. So the cells are there, uh, and maybe they're functioning to inhibit the immune response, but this is really just guilt by association. It doesn't prove that Tregs are controlling the immune response against tumor. So what can you do? And I don't have time to tell you the details of how we did it, but we have a method genetically in the mouse to eliminate Tregs, just get rid of them altogether in an animal with an established tumor in this antigen-expressing context where the immune system is being suppressed. The question is, what happens? What happens when you get rid of Tregs? This is the before picture, before we get rid of Tregs. You can see a nice juicy red tumor here, and the T cells sitting on the sidelines doing nothing. These are the exhausted T cells that are no longer functioning to inhibit the, immune uh, the tumor. Uh, these cells express PD-1. They're in interesting structures that are keeping them here and probably controlling their function. But importantly, they are sitting here, and they're not inside the tumor doing what we hope they will do. So the question is, what happens when you get rid of Tregs in this model? And the answer is shown here. Uh, you get a massive immune response, massive infiltration of T cells, B cells, macrophages, and though I won't show you it, massive tumor destruction. So Tregs can control immune responses. We believe, and many others do as well, that Treg control might be an important new strategy for anti-tumor treatments. Um, we need to figure out how to do this selectively, because if you get rid of Tregs everywhere, that's actually bad for the patient. It's going to lead to an autoimmune response. So you need to figure out how to do it locally, and we're working towards that in the lab right now. So that's story number one. Story number two, which will also go quickly, involves uh, this aspect of tumorigenesis, another major focus in my lab and another major focus in the field, namely enumerating all of the genes that are mutated in the development of cancers. And the list grows and grows. We now know of at least 600 genes that are mutated in the development of human cancers. 
uh, not in every cancer, of course, not in every cancer type, but across all cancers, something like 600 of the 22,000 genes in your genome are mutated to gain of function or loss of function in the development of cancer. And these, uh, these studies are summarized in articles like those shown here, whole genome, transcriptome, landscape analyses of various cancer types. And it's bewildering, frankly. Uh, in lung cancer, which we study, the average tumor has 175 protein-altering mutations. That's a lot. That's a lot to do functional analysis on. It's very difficult, actually, in the types of experiments that we do in my lab to functionally characterize or functionally validate the contributions of that large set of genes because to program those mutations into the germline of a mouse and then cross it into a tumor model like the ones we've created takes years to do and several hundred thousand dollars to do as well. And so we've hoped that there would be a better way. And it turns out, fortunately, as many of you know, there is a better way that was just recently um, recognized and optimized to perform efficient genome editing, and that's the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Hopefully you've heard of this. I'm sure you've heard of this. It's a method that's derived from a natural process in bacteria of bacterial immunity, where based on a simple system involving an enzyme that cuts DNA called Cas9, and an RNA or RNAs that drag that enzyme to its site in the genome, one can cut and thereby mutate any gene of interest with great precision uh, and great facility. This is what it looks like in its current state, one of its current states. Here's the enzyme Cas9 and a nuclease. Here's the target in the genome. And the enzyme is being brought to the target by virtue of a short RNA species that binds to the target by base pair complementarity and binds to Cas9. And after it binds, Cas9 then leaves the DNA. And if you leave the cell to its natural processes, it'll try to fix that break in the DNA and often make a mistake, leading to an insertion or a deletion mutation. If you provide a template to repair the break that, for example, has a mutation, you can introduce that mutation very easily into the cells uh, at that site. Now, this method uh, was really optimized very, very recently, only about three years ago. This paper in science by Doudna and Charpentier these papers in science by Feng Zhang and George Church really led us to the realization that this was an incredibly powerful tool just about three years ago. And since then, there have been more than 2,500 papers published on this topic of CRISPR. So it's rapidly taking over the field um, and incredibly powerful. It's been used for lots of different purposes. Uh, you probably read about them, modifying genes in the germline, modifying genes in cell culture, carrying out screens. And there are companies based on carrying out screens using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. KSQ recently launched, for example, that's uh, doing this. We decided to ask whether we could use CRISPR-Cas9 to mutate genes in vivo, skipping the germline step. Just go straight into the developing tumor and mutate genes of interest, thereby cutting out lots of time and saving lots of money. We've done it a couple of different ways, initially in collaboration with Dan Anderson's lab, and more recently using our lung model, the one that I've described to you. Here's a lung model again. And here again, we're using a virus that carries Cre, the enzyme to do RAS and P53. But now we've modified the virus to also carry Cas9, the endonuclease, and a space to put one of those guide RNAs to drag Cas9 to a place in the genome. And we've targeted lots of different genes this way now, including the tumor suppressor genes shown on this slide, NKX2.1, APC, and P10, as proof of principle that inactivating these genes in these tumors as they develop will change the phenotype. And the answer is they do. Won't spend a lot of time on this. It was published a little over a year ago. If we target NKX2.1, as shown here, we change the tumor phenotype. If we target P10 instead, we change the tumor phenotype, but differently. If we target APC, we change the tumor phenotype, but again, differently. And altogether, in this experiment that was completed about six months after it started, and about seven months after it was conceived, we generated hundreds of tumor samples differing in genotype this would have taken us years to do previously and cost literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. But this tool has allowed us to really fast track how this type of analysis will be done. And you can imagine all sorts of things that we can do to study the consequences of these mutations. And for example, the response of these different tumors of different genotype to different therapies in ways that we couldn't have thought about doing before. And this is just the beginning. So CRISPR-Cas9 has really taken over the field. It's going to rapidly accelerate what we do in the lab. And finally, and I think with implications to new companies and existing companies, this mouse model stuff that I've just described to you will be matched, married, to cell-based analysis using CRISPR. Genome screens looking for vulnerabilities of cancer cells using in vitro 
screening technologies, and these will then allow for identification of candidates that represent vulnerabilities of the cancer cells that can then be retested now in vivo and ultimately identify new genes and pathways that can be tested back in the patient. So I'll stop there and thank many people who've done the work. I don't know for how long I talked. I hope I didn't go over at least badly. And uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So let's see if there's a short question for, for Tyler right off the bat. If not, we have a, an exciting question and answer session right coming up. All right, I think we'll save the questions for the panel. Um, thanks so much, Tyler. I want, I want to say that I don't know if you all know this, and we'll now um, go to a break, but I wanted to inspire you for this break and also inspire you to come back. We have a panel discussion coming up where uh, I'm going to uh, give the floor to the eminent uh, Joanna Lee, MIT alum and moderator, who will moderate a, a wonderful discussion with uh, each of these panelists, but also with Catherine Bodish, who is the VP of uh, Sunrise Ventures of Sanofi, who will be joining us on stage. But I wanted to say that, you know, certainly on uh, my end of things here, for, uh, from, from learning just about all of the stuff that has been happening in this field, excitement doesn't even start to cover my emotions when I think about the progress that is being made in this field, even just as observed by a casual observer. There are some tremendous people in this room who have contributed to an astronomical, I think, increase in knowledge about very key cancer areas. So I'd like to encourage you, and um, you know, as we go to the break, to think about this in terms of questions, not just meeting people, but what we're really trying to do here in this room is foster something that's even bigger, better, and faster. This is MIT. We can't just be happy with Kendall Square being the absolute best area for cancer and bio biology research. This, uh, you know, hopefully is a catalytic place where startups and, and um, you know, uh, industry and, uh, uh, and uh, academia can work to find ecosystems that can work even more optimally. So that is the topic, and please come back in 15 minutes for that discussion.